So let me suggest a particular take on this. My, my understanding is basically as a historian, uh, and I've been reviewing uh, the contemporary history of American firearms for the last 50 years for the past several years. And uh, um, I have an upcoming uh, contribution to that project on the Great Plains. Now, the, the background here very quickly is that I, I pitched the project as a two-book deal. One would be the play-by-play, -play, in effect, a, a narrative history. That was published uh, as Between Two Fires uh, a little over a year ago. And then I wanted a, a color commentary book, a collection of essays. And uh, that simply um, blew away from me very quickly. And I began to realize that we are a confederation of fire regions. And so these became short, say, 200 page or less uh, surveys uh, for Florida, California, Northern Rockies, Southwest. All these are published. The Great Plains will be out uh, in a couple of months. And then uh, a few others will, will round it out. So um, the understanding here is basically uh, to be historically informed uh, background, but also to provide, if you will, a kind of uh, color commentary. So these are not comprehensive science surveys. Um, they're sort of, um, well, there's something more than travel logs or journalism, uh, but there's something less than uh, full body histories or, or uh, encyclopedias of fire science. And this will give you the map from the air. will give you a, a sense of what some of the places are. So how do I, how do I go, how do I understand the plains? Well, I understand it as, as a place for fire and a place where American cultures have, have uh, come to grips with it. So in a general way, let's, let me, let me explain how I think about the fire history here. Fire, fire results, uh, the basic rhythm of fire is to have uh, periods of wetting and drying. It has to be wet enough to grow stuff, then dry enough to burn it off under conditions. And so that's the natural setting. Uh, lightning is certainly uh, a presence. Um, what makes the plains and the grasslands particularly interesting, though, I think you have a, a competition that in the woods uh, we, we tend to ignore. And that's the role. It's not just fire and fuel uh, or fire and flame and flora. There's also fauna. You have these. Um, you have lots and lots of animals, and um, you know that small stuff. The grass, the forbs, are are fuel uh, of two kinds. They can go to fast combustion that we call fire, or they can go to the slow combustion uh, uh, that metabolizes the same chemistry, but it occurs in cells. And that competition makes the story very interesting, but also uh, complicated. So how do people play into this? Well, they change the dynamics of the animals, but uh, they also actively burn. This was a historical study published uh, quite a few years ago, but looked at uh, accounts of burning and the, so uh, in red uh, what the seasonality of those reported accounts were, and then the blue describes uh, you know, the, the percentage of lightning fires. And I think that's probably pretty accurate, although uh, I would put, historically, there was likely a lot more in the spring. And the, the graph that just flashed up is a recent one of uh, a national, you know, all environments across the country, ignitions by human and lightning, humans dominate. Uh, but uh, it's also clear that, that people do most of the burning in the spring prior to the, the lead up to lightning. And that way, they've protected uh, what they what they want protected or what they want burned done it under controlled conditions. That spike um, on the June-July, by the way, is uh, the 4th of July, so uh, ways in which culture uh, affects it. So what you know, what do we have of sort of aboriginal by aboriginal? I mean uh, basic economies dependent on, on hunting, gathering, uh, and burning. Uh, we've got lots of evidence of uh, burning for, for different reasons. There's a Frederick Remington painting at night and uh, apparently what they are doing is uh, surrounding an encampment that was unwise enough to pitch um, their bedding and, uh, in, dr in dry grass. So they will surround it and then in the panic that results uh, uh, count coup and steal horses. Uh, and there are also accounts of, of fighting or responding to wildfires. If you're going to live in this environment so prone to burning, uh, you have to be able to 
cope with it. Here, um, it's a fixed encampment. This is this is actually from the 1830s, a uh, 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 fur trading uh, expedition that included a Scottish lord and uh, an artist he brought along. And uh, the flames are coming in. Uh, they can't get up and move, so they're setting back fires, swatting them on the downwind side, and then hoping they create a barrier before the, the main fire reaches the camp. American pioneers, lots and lots of accounts of prairie fires. Uh, here's Charles Dees uh, with two, one uh, trapper, a uh, rearing horse, uh, lightning in the background, a nice touch. Um, and then uh, a wagon train, also unwise enough to camp in uh, large dead grass and then having to respond. So fires were, were seen by people, particularly people coming out of uh, wooded lands or even a Europe a Europe, a temperate Europe that really has no natural basis for fire, encountering this very strange phenomenon and seeing it as a threat. The primary way to defend yourself, though, as illustrated here, what today we would call an escape fire, and uh, you light a fire. And uh, then you move into the burned area uh, before the main fire reaches you. And the upper left one there is a courier and Ives print, the trapper's defense, as it was called. The uh, lower one is from um, an exploring expedition. But I like both of them because it's American Indian who is setting it. And so there's a very clear transfer of fire experience and uh, knowledge that occurs uh, going on. So understanding the fire history of the plains is really tough. I think of it as a, a three-body problem. Because on one hand, you've got fire and grazers as consumers competing for the same stuff. Uh, and you've also got lightning and humans uh, competing as sources. And how all of these interact is a very complicated uh, problem. I, I don't think it's ever going to be resolved uh, mechanistically. Uh, it's all about probabilities. There are too many uncertainties, uh, not just climate, but uh, economic cycles uh, and so forth that govern uh, how these interplay. So the Great Plains, during the process of settlement, the early time, well, we, we cleaned out the burners, put them on reserves, and then uh, we wiped out uh, large amounts of the grazers. So in effect, I think this system by the post-Civil War period is, is pretty rapidly unraveling. In effect, to the extent people had control over fuels and fire and how that dynamic played out is, is unraveling. And so I think a lot of the really expansive wildfires and soaring extensive flames that we find recorded may be an artifact of, of that uh, collision. Of that, of that frontier that will later uh, settle down. Still, uh, particularly if you're farming in uh, savanna areas or, or uh, tall grass prairie, you have to protect yourself uh, from fire, so you plow fire breaks around. Uh, you organized fire crews. This is uh, the 1870s in Kansas, so we've got a plow cutting a line, people burning along behind, and then all the uh, flappers there to keep keep the uh, backfire uh, from spilling over the plow line. Uh, organized crews, uh, or semi-organized crews quite early. And the favorite technique after uh, cattle became uh, a major part uh, was the so-called beef drag. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt writes about it uh, in the Dakotas. Here's uh, Frederick Remington illustrating it. And the idea was you would go out and slaughter a big Steer, split it in half, and then drag the carcass across the flaming front. And we're told this was worth uh, 50 men. And here we've got it, a WPA mural from uh, Plant, Texas. Um, so lots of devices uh, where you have to protect the winter range. Uh, very active programs of fire control. This is actually eastern Oklahoma, uh, Wichita uh, National Forest areas. Uh, organized uh, fire wagons, uh, used uh, windmills to spot fires, uh, fighting it along the edge. Here they don't have the advantage of a beef drag, so they're having a whole lot of fun uh, swatting and uh, wetting the flaming front. Uh, 
Um, the other way to protect yourself, particularly winter range, after you can no longer migrate, and that was part of how that the old system worked, was that fires, uh, flocks, and people were all in migration over fairly large areas of land. But when you start having fixed land ownership, tenure, then um, you have to you have to be more careful uh, about when things burn and how. So you would plow um, fire breaks here mechanically, and then you would burn out the strips between them, and that would uh, hopefully protect. This is a this is in the Nebraska sand hills, and there was an old argument about whether uh, whether trees could grow in the plains, whether it was a climatic problem or whether it was a fire problem. And And here uh, it was shown it was pretty much a fire problem because you could plant as long as you quell the fires, you could grow forests, even extensive ones. So prairie fire, a great phenomenon, and as long as there are prairies. Um, when the prairies disappear, so this record from Illinois, part of the prairie peninsula extending eastward, shows um, you pretty much extinguish the fires. And at most you will have field burning, but the old prairie dynamic uh, vanishes. And part of what begins changing, the big, what makes the really large transition is not just the conversion, the steady conversion uh, to farms, uh, but the introduction of a whole new economy, uh, an industrial economy, and a new combustion economy, in this case burst based on, on burning fossil fuels. And I like this uh, Courier and Ives print. Not only did trains start lots of fires, um, but this one is dividing the landscape in two. And there's one where you have open burning and animals uh, and the whole complex uh, and one in the foreground, in effect, the future, uh, where those are going to disappear and be changed to something different. And this, this transition to an industrial uh, combustion state is, is a global phenomenon. And I'll just give you a quick uh, snapshot of how I think this plays out. Here's a satellite uh, composites of, of lights, Earth at night, uh, and you can see Europe uh, illuminated with electric lights. Not all of that is uh, based on uh, fossil fuel combustion, but most of it is. And then Sub-Sahara Africa, almost all of the illumination is the result of open burning. And what's interesting is that even in, in Africa, the two don't coexist or at most they coexist for a transitional period. And eventually, um, the industrial economy takes fire out of the, um, out of the landscape. So we have a conversion of landscapes to modern agriculture. We're often told, you know, the fire doesn't respect borders, but it seems to me it does, uh, particularly where those borders uh, have roads and large field breaks and changes in uh, combustibles. Uh, if we put a big shopping mall in the middle of that, that would certainly uh, change uh, the dynamic. So we're we're changing in very large ways, a fundamentally different change, and that is changing the character of fire on the land. And we're seeing some ecological blowback. Here's the eastern red cedar. I had no idea it was so extensive a pest uh, until I got to uh, uh, visit some sites. Um, so, in a sense, we're taking carbon out of the past, we're burning it off, it's being recaptured, and part of it is in forms that uh, can again burn or alter the dynamics of, of fire regimes. So, um, we know that fire hasn't disappeared, we still have wildfire. Uh, mostly, the burning occurs in preserves uh, or scientific sites or protected lands. Um, here's a USGS map of large fires, finds 100 hectares or more from 1980 to 2003. And it's interesting to see where the Great Plains fit in here. Uh, generally, it's pretty, it's pretty clear that the large fires occur on public lands. It's pretty much a map of land that's uh, publicly owned or private land that is used for public purposes. Uh, there are some exceptions, a nice cluster around the Flint Hills. Uh, and then uh, in the northern plains, some interesting stuff, but primarily uh, um, a shift in land ownership. So we see where are fires now? Uh, they're in places like uh, Conza Prairie, Flint Hills, uh, interesting exception. 
uh, they're, uh, they're in Nature Conservancy prairies, they're in other places where we're trying to restore and maintain um, primarily tall grass prairie seems to be the, the, the primary target and of course uh, public land so I'll just put the NWCG group in the middle uh, for those as well. And I think the real question uh, for the future of fire on the Great Plains is what's going to happen in the private sector. Uh, will the patch burning model that uh, uh, is being promoted uh, spread and uh, put fire in a different way out there or uh, is feral fire going to return if land is uh, abandoned or, or um, simply left um, in, a, in a differently managed way. So that's that's a thumbnail uh, thumbnail sketch of the history. Let me let me indulge now in a little of what what I try to bring uh, to the subject. Oh. Well, don't, don't hit the X. Hit this. Yeah. A Hello, we've got got some background. Thank you. Uh, a cultural survey. I I've, I've been using primarily uh, works of art, uh, painting. As, as background, and that's not just because they're really cool images, but because um, to show that the way in which fire uh, in the Great Plains is a part of the larger culture. And it's interesting that one of the things, one of the ways that's manifest is that there is a tradition of fire art. A lot of major American artists, as well as minor ones, uh, painted prairie fires. And this isn't true. You would everywhere. So you would think places that have lots of fire will of course have, have lots of fire paintings. Not true. Uh, certain areas develop it. Finland on the upper right has a tradition. Sweden doesn't. Uh, Australia in the middle has a long tradition of art. In fact it goes back to Aboriginal art. You can see about uh, probably five to ten percent of bush uh, of uh, bark paintings of uh, all bushfires. And then the lower right uh, Russia. Uh, Russia has a fine tradition of fire uh, art uh, in forests. Canada doesn't. You look in vain to find it. Well, the Great Plains does. And uh, that's, a re that's because we've, we, landscape art was in vogue. Major artists painted landscapes. They went out to the frontier and the first frontier they often encountered would be the Great Plains and they would see fires burning on the prairies and then it becomes an established motif. So people, people copy it. We have a tradition of fire literature. Um, yeah, Little House does have a fire in it. Uh, almost all settler accounts, almost all of the, the major literature, certainly from the northern plains, from the central to northern plains up, uh, does. But these are primarily prairies, prairie areas, not plains. They're, they're tied mostly to farming, uh, much less to ranching. And it has a uh, it's interesting. We, we have two major traditions of fire literature tied to settlement, and one is one is the prairies, and the other is uh, around the Great Lakes area, where we had the mega fires of the 19th century, and uh, these gave rise to a literature. And it's not until Norman McLean uh, creates fire as a memoir that literature returns. So the plains have a great tradition of literature, uh, a great tradition of, of fire science. Um, think of Charles Bessie, one of the founders of um, you know, American School of Botany uh, at the University of Nebraska. His students, uh, like Frederick Clemens, uh, helped to put fire uh, into ecological thinking, not in the way we would imagine it today, but very much uh, a part of, of what is going on. Uh, and it's an important challenge to forestry because Foresters had established themselves as basically the oracles um, and researchers for fire. And it was important that the grasslands present a kind of counter tradition. And in fact, Clemens, based on his grassland, publishes one of the first, one of the founding works of American forest fire ecology. 1910, he did a study of Lodgepole Pine near Estes Park, Colorado. And this matters too because we don't really have an intellectual identity for fire as a subject. You know, in the ancient world it was one of the elements. Uh, Heraclitus made it uh, the emblem of a world in change. Aristotle made fire uh, sort of the, the um, 
the test topic for explaining uh, change in the natural world, part of his physics. And then in the 19th century, that, that all disappears. And the only group that has any interest in fire uh, in itself is, is forestry, um, which has had all kinds of um, all kinds of repercussions for how we understand fire. So the, the line I like to use generally is that uh, you know all of the other ancient elements, water, earth, air, all have intellectual disciplines devoted to their study. In fact, whole academic departments, but the only fire department on the university is the one that sends emergency vehicles when an alarm sounds. So where does fire go? It's, it's important that it wasn't left only in forestry, uh, but that uh, uh, the plains challenged, challenged that and created another. It also, uh, it also has given rise to large uh, controversies, large and enduring controversies which continue today. Uh, Thomas Jefferson and uh, John Adams in their correspondence debated about the origins of the prairies to the far west. Was this the result of climate or was it the result of people and fire? And uh, Jefferson came out in favor of uh, Indian burning as the, as the primary uh, source. But this is a controversy which still continues and has ramified well beyond the plains, uh, continues today. So tradition of fire science, wow, we've got some great centers for fire research and fire ecology and restoration. Uh, Curtis Prairie, uh, longstanding. Conza Prairie, king of the hills. Uh, it's a, an extraordinary center and has been uh, for decades for uh, not just for, for prairie science, but, but for fire and for demonstrating uh, the value. So well, well rooted uh, traditions of fire science. And uh, there's the fire politics and fire and conservation thinking. The, for a long time, this was considered the great American desert. That is, you could not have permanent settlements here. It would be too difficult, particularly as you move uh, west of the 100th or 98th meridian. Um, and then during the Dust Bowl era, um, the plains and questions of, of settlement and, and indirectly of fire uh, come, uh, become major uh, political issues um, and spark uh, programs and controversies about um, how to manage these lands. And as a result, we get a series of national grasslands and transfer or where it had not been patented originally, uh, reserve into uh, federal land and permanent public domain. Today, uh, what to become of this land? Who should own it? How should it be managed? Big controversies. Uh, Nature Conservancy, this, here's their Tallgrass Prairie Preserve, very active in, in prairie. Um, protection and restoration. In fact, we've created a, a kind of civil society for fire that is not government-based. And uh, Great Plains Restoration Council, all the controversy about uh, Buffalo Commons and what, what to do uh, with these lands in the future, all become uh, very political issues and are tied into a long tradition of how to manage uh, these lands. And since these lands will burn and need to burn, uh, that spills over into fire, and it's a very healthy counterweight uh, to some of the dominance given other regions. And then we come to Texas. What to do with Texas? Um, you know, it hadn't really occurred to me until I got into this project that attempts to date to tell the national story of uh, American fire, landscape fire, have managed to ignore Texas. And what's What's really amazing is that no one noticed. Um, even Texans didn't seem uh, to voice much uh, much concern. It's also um, curious because the first textbook we have for uh, fire control, published 1946, it's published by a guy with the Texas Forest Service, previously with uh, the U.S. Forest Service in East Texas, uh, A.D. Uh, Fulwaller, and then 18, uh, 1982, the first reasonably comprehensive uh, survey of fire ecology in the U.S., North America, 
Henry White out of Texas Tech, one of the authors. And yet we see almost nothing of Texas in the national story. It's as though for fire as for electricity, Texas had its own grid and uh, simply wasn't connected. And then, of course, <coughs> excuse me, um, about 20 years ago, things started to change, and Texas started seeing fires of a sort that it had not seen for a long time. In fact, you know, the first fire we have recorded by Europeans in uh, North America is uh, 1529, as Cabeza de Vaca describes Texas Indians uh, fire hunting for rabbits. So part of my, my little tour, I called it Six Fires Over Texas, was to go around the state and try, try to explain explain why this was happening. Uh, and there are, of course, many causes, but the result is that Texas is being um, reconnected with the rest of the country. And then the, the short answer is why, why was Texas off the grid? Uh, I think it's because of how Texas was admitted, and uh, it kept its public domain, you know, which meant that there was no real federal land, no federal presence for fire in Texas except in a small way in the 1930s, a few fish and wildlife refuges later, uh, Big Bend National Park. There was no mechanism to move what happened in Texas nationally and vice versa. So Texas uh, remains an interesting story, but I also think that one interpretation to what we're seeing is that what we had regarded as a primarily Western fire problem seems to be moving eastward. And it's a result of climate, uh, land use, uh, lots of changes. But what we had regarded as a particular Western pathology, large fires burning into communities, uh, is no longer confined to California or even the interior West. It's in Oklahoma. It's in uh, Texas. It's moving into Florida and the coastal plains. And so I think Texas historically has been where the South met the West, where that uh, expansion westward funneled through in particular ways, and now we may see it uh, reverse. Anyway, this is how the fire scene looks to NASA. Hot spots, not just wildfires. Most of those big wildfires are in yellow and other kinds of burning in red. Most of the burning is agricultural or forestry, commercial forestry burning. Huge concentration uh, along the Flint Hills area, another concentration. Um, in the eastern part of uh, North Dakota, the plains figure pretty largely. So there's still in the national scene a lot of fire here, and we need to understand. Uh, we need I, people like me need to try to put a narrative on what those maps mean. So thinking about the future, uh, you know I have enough trouble with the past and trying to make sense out of that. The future is pretty hard to divine. But let's uh, let's try a little pyrome and see what, what kinds of trends are underway that might affect the future of fire in the Great Plains. Well, one is climate change, of course, and even more immediately, land use change and how those two interact. And a lot of land use is going to be demography, uh, the continued uh, exodus of uh, populations, rural populations, out of much of the Great Plains uh, for demographic re for uh, economic reasons. What is this land going to be? If the land is simply feral, then we're going to see a lot of feral fire. If that land is going to be put to some purpose, what purpose? How do we understand the change in purposes uh, amidst climate? Uh, and with invasives like eastern red cedar, uh, how is this going to play out? I don't think anyone knows, but the revival of wildfire is clearly tied uh, to these uh, to these changes, and possibly the revival of, of prescribed fire as an alternative. Uh, one can hope, um, you know. But you know, the Great Plains, as I look back on it, looking looking across the Pleistocene, let's take let's widen the aperture and take a really long range view. It's a whole story of, of filling and emptying and then refilling and then re-emptying. And we may have what we take as the norm, the sort of this wave of settlement which filled uh, which filled much of the plains. We may just see the backside of that and a period of relative emptying. And um, that will change 
the dynamic and composition of fire. And I think the deep, the deep driver here is going to be uh, the combustion competition because it's no longer just between uh, you know, metabolic combustion and fire combustion, no longer just between lightning and people. We've introduced uh, another competitor here, which is uh, industrial combustion, burning of fossil fuels, or as I like to think of it, the burning of lithic landscapes, and how the societies and combustion practices of, of people living basically of a fossil fuel uh, civilization on living landscapes uh, that require um, open burning, how that plays out is going to have a lot to do uh, with the future of fire. So um, evening satellite photo of lights, um, we can see. There's our, our fossil fuel civilization lit up, and there's the back and shale, all those uh, flares uh, burning off the, the fracking uh, gases. Um, wow, what, a, what an enormous um, <laughs> patch of pyrogeography, very different kind than what we're used to. Now, I, I put the, the, the color photo as an aerial of uh, uh, prairie pothole region in eastern. North Dakota. So east and west North Dakota, we've got a, a really interesting contrast. The eastern part is a relic of, of a Pleistocene landscape. It's one in which open burning occurs and needs to occur. Um, even for you know all those um, all those waterfowl uh, using the ponds, they still nest and, and feed in the uplands. So there's an interesting ancient cycle of fire tied to rhythms of burning. Go across across the Missouri uh, into western uh, North Dakota. We have we have a very different world. What we might even think of as a, as a kind of pyrocene, uh, a fire animated, uh, fire powered world. Uh, humans, hey, we're the we're the keystone species for fire on the planet. We change our combustion habits. That's going to ripple through a lot of stuff, not just greenhouse gases but how we live in the land, what gets burned, what doesn't get burned, what we consider resources, all these things get, get folded into this. So I'm thinking that you know, the long term, certainly in the short long term, in the order of decades, uh, this is what's going to, this is how these two competing combustions play out is going to be what, what determines uh, the future of fire on the plains. So return to uh, Tallgrass Prairie Preserve. Um, I know my, my hosts were baffled. Why is this guy? We're taking him out to one of the premier natural areas in North America. And why is this guy taking photographs of pump jacks? He's taking photographs because I see two kinds of fire here. And there is one that's burning living landscapes that's integrally tied in with those free-ranging bison and with the whole dynamic of ecology uh, on Tallgrass uh, Prairie, and yet that's framed. Literally, I tried to create a, a, a visual image that frames that within this industrial society, and how those two play out you know, seems to me uh, what the future is the future question. Um, we're certainly going to have to look for uh, renewables. Uh, the Great Plains have huge opportunities here. Uh, wind uh, is already uh, becoming a major source. Certainly the Southern Plains could go solar very easily. Uh, how that changes, uh, not just you know what is pumped or not pumped on these sites, but um, how that changes the kind of civilization uh, that's going on and how what we need out of our out of our landscapes, how we live on those landscapes and see ourselves in relationship to it, will really determine um, how fire appears on that background and how much it appears. So uh, I don't have answers to that. What I'll suggest is that looking over, uh, playing playing the historian, fire guy interested in history, um, why should the Great Plains matter? They they matter a lot, and um, Right now, they, they are not uh, a national presence. Uh, 
uh, the Flint Hills and areas of active burning are a very vigorous regional presence, but I think they could and should be more of a national, uh, part of the national story, and that's part of why I, I'm interested in getting that regional uh, survey into it. Um, but how uh, how that future is is going to evolve, too many uncertainties. But I think my sense is that th this is how I would frame for the future as we look into it. So, with that, uh, anybody have any questions? Any questions? We have anything? I guess you can send it in by typing or turn on a mic. I suppose you could. Blair, you yeah, must have. Sorry, some. I couldn't. My my button was stuck. Um, if anybody has any questions, I've unmuted you, and you can either type it in the chat or you can talk if you have a microphone on your computer. Steve, do you see those comments on the side? Do you want to comment on those? I don't see any comments. Okay, there's a chat box <laughs> at the bottom. I, okay, let's see. Pointer? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, now I, I got it now. Okay. Let me see. What do we have? And sound, yes, sound. Another reason uh, why Texas tends to be isolated is that we don't have a single fire regime statewide. The people in East Texas work in the Longleaf, North Central works with the Great Plains, West Texas, Sky Island Study, etc. Oak Juniper, Central Texas doesn't have a great analog anywhere else in the U.S. Um, in a sense, that's that's true, uh, but lots of places have, have different fire regimes. I mean, I live in Arizona, we've got everything from uh, desert grasslands to um, basically, uh, you know, mixed high elevation uh, mixed conifer forest. I think part of it is um, Texas, because it, it has historically controlled its lands. It doesn't. It doesn't act. It doesn't act like an American state. It acts like a Canadian province. And so the kinds of solutions Texas is is taking in the integration seems to me much closer to what we see in Canada. Um, certainly there are, there are big differences uh, in fire but around Texas, but you know every place in Texas can burn. And um, I, I think it is just the, the intensive grazing, the, the shock wave of grazing and the continued heavy grazing uh, that kept fire under wraps and prevented it from uh, from really becoming an issue. And now, changes in the Texas economy, demographics, settlement practices, we're seeing a lot of that land now coming back in forms that can burn and without the old sort of controls. And so tex the Texas State, Texas Forest Service has had to expand uh, to assume that role. It's behaving very much again like I would think the fire agencies in Canadian provinces. And how that integrates with the U.S., how it integrates with the national story will be interesting to see. Uh, but I was really stunned as I got into it and realized how much fire there historically had been in Texas. Why Texas was simply off the, off the grid nationally it was out of the narrative. We have a few more questions. Okay, we've also got some other comments where we see a significant burning of coastal refuges, but that's, that's also a public lands. Um, what about the EPA deciding burning of grass in spring is a health hazard? I don't know that particular one. Um, if you can't burn in the spring, you're going to have a very hard time managing uh, managing grass lights uh, for fire. Um, I, I, I don't I don't I don't know the particulars of that, so I don't know what exactly the the issue there. It was the largest record? Yeah. Stephen, this is Carol, and I'm 
believe the reference is to uh, smoke management um, and, and the fact that with, with so much burning there is a, a smoke problem. Yeah, but I think that's manageable. I mean, uh, there, there are smoke problems everywhere, and uh, EPA has not really shut down burning uh, in many places, certainly not for very long. Um, it's getting harder, but it's, it should be negotiable, and they seem to be willing where there are uh, some ecological uh, values uh, to negotiate, but I don't know the particulars there. And now we have... Okay, uh, so let's see. Oh, largest recorded fire in the Midwest. Um, the largest one I, I know of is in uh, the State Plains area, High Plains, uh, Texas, spilling over. Um, and it's about 6 million acres. That's, that's an estimate because, uh, you know, it resulted from cowboys spending several days <laughs> riding around and making an estimate, but very, very large fires are possible uh, in those areas. Uh, the largest fires that I know of continuously are in grasslands, some in Africa and, and Australia, but uh, the southern high plains uh, certainly have great capacity. So here we have uh, Mike Oliver, state forester for NRCS in, in Texas, major problems with the upland encroachment in East Texas pine due to fire suppression. Yeah. Um, and uh, we've got, uh, you know, so much, so much of the research in Texas. This is part of another reason I think why fire ecology has not escaped uh, uh, is from Texas outward is that so much of it is concerned with, with brush encroachment and removing brush. It has not been a kind of full scan of fire ecology. It's been using fire as a relatively cheap and benign way uh, to get rid of encroaching brush all to the good, but um, I'm not sure that, I think that may help to account for part part of the, the omission. So here we've got uh, Jenks High School. Uh, you mentioned demographic transition. Do you think the urbanization is driving loss of fire culture? And then when the urban population returns to the country, it causes conflict. Uh, there are lots of things. Uh, people, people in cities don't like smoke. Uh, and they don't like, uh, they tend not to like fire um, in their backyard. It's fine, it's fine in the wilderness, it's fine in the back country. Uh, they don't want it uh, on their patio, uh, and that's understandable. And urban people, uh, as you urbanize, you remove fire from your daily life. You don't see it as a part of, of what goes on and makes the world uh, work. Uh, and people tend to, all they know about fire is what they see uh, on TV or uh, monitors of one kind, and fire is universally presented in those cases as either a disaster or if there's a firefight as, as, a, as a war story. And uh, we're ill-served by this. Uh, and then as people move out, uh, sprawling suburbs or exurbs, they begin encountering fires either wild or prescribed, and, and they don't like it. It does cause conflict. Uh, and that creates uh, zones of protection, not only for flame, but also for smoke. And these sort of protectorates, the, the urban zone is actually much larger than the, the footprint on the land because you create kind of larger protectorates which make it more difficult um, to use fire. There are also real questions, you know, if people want to use fire on private land about liability and uh, what, what the legal responsibilities are. And, you know, that's a law that can be changed. You can, you can make this work. You, can, you should be able to deal with it. Um, so I think there's a big education uh, uh, project that's needed. Uh, and a lot of it will be um, lands that are being set aside uh, either as public ownership or under some kind of... Uh, private ownership or consortium of private owners or uh, collaboratives uh, that are trying to restore large expanses of, of native grasslands um, or the conditions, pre-settlement conditions. Those areas, I think, will be able to burn and uh, not easy, but they will be able to burn. 
with that middle ground between those sort of outright protected zones and uh, creeping sprawl, or in some cases uh, galloping sprawl, uh, that middle zone is what's, what's at risk. And uh, I think it will f probably be decided on the basis of, of land ownership and tenure, which in turn will depend on um, economic considerations. So, and that's not unique to the Plains. The Plains has its unique expression of these. I have to say, a few years ago, I had a chance when I took this photo, uh, there was an outbreak of wildfire, and uh, driving back to uh, Stillwater, we we actually saw houses uh, on fire, and I w I was left wondering why are these places burning? Uh, this is not, you know, immersed in, you know. Um, high volatile woodlands and shrub, uh, these places should not be burning and they should be fairly easy to protect. But somehow the, me the coping mechanism seemed to have been lost and that may be part of the cultural change that goes with, with urbanization. <laughs>